Welcome to the Wealth by Choice podcast. My name is Valerie Shira, and I'm a stay-at-home mom who turned entrepreneur. Each week, we bring you stories and wisdom from individuals who have broken the code to generating wealth. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Let's get started. So today I have with me Chad Tucker. Chad is the owner and operator of Acorn Capital Solutions. Acorn Capital is a multifamily investment company that specializes in Central Florida. Their mission is to provide safe, clean, professional management housing to residents in Central Florida while making passive income for investors. Chad is a full-time real estate investor, full-time firefighter, father of four, and husband. Chad started his journey in multifamily investing in 2020. Since then, he has assessed asset managed over 61 units valued at $8.5 million. Chad, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for hopping on the podcast with me today. Oh, I love it. I always love coming on these things and talking and just learning about what everyone else is doing. Well, I mean, I've met you. We've we've been to a couple different, I think, uh, events together, real estate events. Yeah. And I've got to hear pieces of your story, but I'm really excited just to kind of start from the beginning and be able to just pick your brain and some of the things that you've gone through. So can we start by just telling us a little bit more about you, a little bit deeper, and then we can kind of go from there? Yeah, so me and you share the same story. We have a ton of kids, so I think that I think that gives all of us a big why in life. Uh, my my journey to a lot of kids wasn't the planned one, but like I always say, the good Lord thinks I can handle more than I can, so we, we just see what we can do. <laughs> so uh, started out in 2003, I graduated high school, and I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. Uh, a few weeks later, I saw a bad auto accident, and my dad used to volunteer firefighting, and I got asked to go up there, and it, it just clicked. I wrote one call and they said all kinds of fancy words like where does it hurt and how do I help them and and realistically looking back we probably did nothing for this patient compared to like today's standards but I was hooked so I I, I just invested myself for years into it still having a drive to do something different fast forward several years later I did a little bit of wholesaling Uh, it's very cutthroat in the single family world it really is (laughs) and 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 I, it just it didn't fit my personality, so mm-hmm. I showed them and I, I backed out of it because, you know, that's the right thing to do, right? Give up when it gets hard. And I went back to being a firefighter full-time. I, I went through the career rank. I, I got promoted to lieutenant, which is a, a great gig. I ride on a big ladder truck. I have six people that work with me. We have a fun 24-hour shift. But we have four kids, and I miss Christmases. I miss birthdays. I miss holidays. I miss stupid little things that they do at the house, and it, it started to wear on me. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I didn't see an end in sight. Uh, so I went back to look for something different, and, and real estate really drew me back in, and I researched tons, and like, okay, what, what, what do I wanna do? I lived in a multifamily and residential because I could add value, but at the same time, help people, and lo and behold, the second I get into the communities of, I mean, I've talked to people that I don't even understand why they talk to me, as far as like where they're at in the food chain sure. uh, and, and they're just the givingest people in the world like everyone in this community and in multifamily period is pretty much that way and it's a small community so it's been very beneficial to me because I love being around people like that and it, it's just it's been a lot of hard learning experiences as far as like my mindset and my changing and my behavior and how I look at stuff but honestly I've come to the conclusion the only reason I haven't been better off or successful is because I've chosen not to Mm, that's really good and yeah I definitely have to agree with you as far as like the multifamily world because we were kind of getting a little bit into the single family world and it's kind of every man for himself it's kind of you're all working for yourself you're all kind of competing against each other and it's just a different mindset and then when Jonathan and I started getting into the multifamily we joined Jake and Gino the program and and started to actually meet people in the multifamily it was like wow this is really a team sport and we started to really see that through the people we that we have met and it is interesting that you mentioned like going up the food chain like I still can't believe like today the people that I'm able to talk to the phone numbers that I have that I could just directly <laughs> call and they're I mean they'll pick up and they'll talk to me it's amazing I, I love that about the multifamily world yeah I, I had a conversation with a gentleman I was looking for a lender my attorney that I got referred to from someone else which I still don't even understand why he works with me and he's a great attorney said hey call this guy today he, he's expecting your call he's a lender and I was like okay and it was like 8 in the morning it's the guy's mobile num. I get off the phone with him great guy we hit it off 
he's the v, he's like the vice president of lending for this regional bank. And I'm like, why is he taking my phone call at eight in the morning? Why, <laughs> why do I have a cell phone number? <laughs> and it's because of relationships and everyone in this community is just given. And it's commercial in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Now, you know, as far as like when you were transitioning over, what did your wife think? How, what did your family think? You know, is this crazy getting into real estate, especially multifamily? If you're not in multifamily, it seems like this big, like, I don't know, big thing to get into. And it's a little bit scary. Uh, we're used to doing scary, kind of crazy stuff. Uh, like I said, I have four kids and I tell everyone the story and my wife hates it. But my, my line is I have four kids from three different baby mamas. The catch is I've been married over 10 years and none of my kids are over 10 and <laughs> we have a great relationship. But that came from, we had some hardships conceiving after our first one mm -hmm. and we ended up going into fostering and adoption. It was always a plan B for us because we knew it was a possibility. And one day we get, we were actually on vacation. We get a phone call. We end up picking up a baby girl that was 44 days old and she's now our daughter legally, like fully adopted. Uh, two months later, I'm in a class and my wife's like, hey, what do you think? They have a two-day-old boy. I was like, I think we have a three-month-old girl and you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, lo and behold, that night at 10 o'clock at night, our son Bo got dropped off to us and he's been with us ever since he was two days old and then out of the NICU and stuff. And then, lo and behold, a couple months later, my wife was not feeling well and God said we had one more in us. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, we went through like this whole roller coaster and it's been a crazy life, but it's... It's the craziness that we take chances on that has been very rewarding to us. So when I wanted to go down this road and do it, I explained to my wife, I want to do this because the fire department is great, but I want more. Mm -hmm. And it was really selfish, I think, for me at that time to say for myself, because I'm a public servant, I'm a given person, and it was hard for me to go, I want more, I deserve more, my family deserves more. I mean, we have a lot compared to a lot of people, but that was the mindset I had to get over. Like, it's okay to want more. It's okay to push yourself to that next level, and it's okay if you earn it and do the right thing. Why do you think people struggle with feeling guilty for wanting more? It's almost like there's an honor in, in, in staying low or in, in poverty or in struggle. There's an honor in struggle. You know what I mean? I think, I think it's twofold. I think, one, there's this notion of money's wrong. Like, it, it's not. Like, we hired a cleaning lady and she left her job she hated and it was a weird feeling for us but she's so grateful because she gets to make her own schedule and do her own thing mm -hmm. and it helps us go to the next level as far as more time with our kids and, and not having to worry about stuff mm -hmm. uh, not everyone can do that but like we're helping other people the right. wrong guy that cuts my yard like we're helping him create his business to live the life he wants by doing stuff so the more money we have the more we're able to help other people Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at it that way, it's different. But then the other thing, too, is when you don't have, look, I, I'll, we'll do decent. Like, we, we eat, our kids, we can go on vacation. It's nothing crazy. And I know there's people that live on a different level than us, and we were there a long time ago uh, before we paid off debt and did stuff. But I think it's easier just to tell yourself, like, money's bad, it's bad to be greedy, blah, 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 blah. I'm not trying to look at it because it's your excuse for not doing it. Like, it, mm -hmm. I still do it. Like, it's my excuse for not going to that next level and, and doing more. Because you're like, well, if I do that, I'll be this. And you're not. Mm -hmm. No, I couldn't agree more. That, And I love that you bring that up because that's something that I definitely struggled with. And I felt like, well, you know, it's easy to say, you know, rich people are whatever, you know, mean, stingy, greedy, whatever. And as long as you have that mindset, you don't have to grow. You don't have to become more than you are. And so it's an easy place to stay. But the more I learned and the more I hung around some of these top level, we're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, these people and, and seeing what they are doing and how they're helping and the impact is just unbelievable. And I started to realize, realize that staying small is actually selfish because I'm not helping those around me. I'm not giving my kids a better chance at life. I'm not, like you said, providing a job for somebody to come clean your house. You know, and for us with the virtual assistant agency, you know, the more that I scale, the more um, people in the Philippines that I can help. So I definitely feel like there's an element of kind of getting over that mindset and realizing that it's actually selfless to become more so that you can help more people. And I did not understand that at the beginning. Yeah, I think growing up, that's the hard thing a lot of us have to struggle with, right? Like we're taught da, 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 this lifestyle, and this is a model. I was taught I got a job at the fire department, 
I do my 25 years, maybe I do an extra five in the drop, I retire with a pension check and it's great. Well, I'm 17 years in and that pension check does not look like what I was thinking it was. And I don't want to keep working because believe it or not, like it, it adds stress on your life. There's things that you just can't get back. And I'm tired of giving up that stuff. And it's, it, I did it for years. I've done it for 20 years and I think I've done my part, but also at the same time, like when COVID hit, it got rocky for me. Right. And it, it was a hard time for a lot of us in this industry. Mm-hmm. And I just decided like, okay, I'm at my point that I, I, I need to do something else. Mm-hmm. For sure. Now, okay, so can we talk about like your first multifamily real estate deal? What that looked like? Well, it depends on which one you want to talk about, but right, yeah. yeah uh, so, look, I, I, me and you were talking at the beginning. I'm, I'm. When I started, I wanted to give myself every excuse why I couldn't succeed. Mm-hmm. So, I did a lot of stuff. One is I, I wanted to learn everything. I need to know everything. Unfortunately, what I see with people that are very productive and do well. They only know just enough and then they put the right people in place. So I had to change my mindset. Like I look at P&Ls and I'd be like, dude, I, my mortgage payment's only two grand. This is $14,000 a month mortgage payment. How the hell am I going to, I'm buying a business. I'm not buying a building. I'm buying a business. Can I make the business work? Mm-hmm. And that started to change my mindset. Uh, looking forward, uh, I ended up volunteering basically to help a gentleman that was buying that had a higher net worth. And I asked that manager for him for three months. And that got me over a lot of the unknown. And that was a great experience. It just paid a, or giving to get experience. Mm-hmm. A couple months later, I ended up getting under contract on a 16 unit in Gainesville. It was a broker relationship. So for me, a lot of my leads come from brokers. Everyone has their own strategy and that's fine. But I'd rather have an army of brokers working with me to find deals because it's just a lot of work to find a deal. Mm-hmm. I had talked to this broker for over a year. We had put in offers in several properties that I've lost out to. So like it's, it's don't get, it's not like the first time I talked to him, right? Like it, it just doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Uh, we went best and final. We got it under contract, and the next thing in my head was, "Holy shit! I got to buy a 1.56 million dollar <laughs> property and figure out how to get half a million dollars." And so, like anyone else, I call a good friend of mine who's a mentor and in the community, Bill Hamill. Do you you know Bill mm-hmm. uh, from Toastmasters and all? And I said, Bill, remember that property? I was scared to put an offer in and you kind of told me to do it because I knew it was a good deal. He's like, yeah. He's like, I got it. He's like, oh, congratulations. He's like, I was like, well, now I need someone to sign on a loan because unfortunately my net worth isn't high enough at this point to sign on a $1.5 million loan. So I was like, I need that. Can you do it? And he goes, well, how much money do you need? And I was like, well, we need about 400. He's like, well, Remember how I told you last week when we were talking about this deal and I asked for the address? He goes, yeah. And he's like, if I come in with two 1031s that we have closed, can we be your partner on it, me and his other partner? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it just, it, we were off to the races. And I mean, that deal closed in 45 days and it went really smooth. And it only went that way because of a lot of work I did on the front end. Relationships I built, knowledge I put in place, things I did, people I connected with, because it wasn't I did it. Like I had other people help me and whenever I had a roadblock or something that could come up, I had people I could call and they'd be like, this is what you need to do. Yeah. So it's a 16 units, it's four quadplexes on the north end of Gainesville. It's not student housing, it's blue collar housing. The old owner had owned it for several years, like for probably almost 15 years. And he had owned a lot of stuff. This was his last asset he was selling. So it was, very separate. It was very coincidental to me that it was his last asset that he was owning and it was the first asset I was buying. And it was from a broker that I first ever talked to. So I like it. Yeah. (laughs) We're breaking a lot of first here. So we bought it. The rents were significantly well under market because he self-managed and he was okay with it because he was making what he needed to make on the property. Mm-hmm. We came in, we spent about seventy, eighty thousand dollars on new roofs and some other stuff that needed to be done. We raised rents and turned the units as needed, spending about ten to fifteen thousand dollars a unit on a turn because they were just we needed to bring them up to today's standard from the eighty standard. Mm-hmm. And it's been performing very well. Within a year we refied it, we locked in to a long term five year debt and it's it's performing better than we thought. And that goes to just being around the right people. Mm-hmm. 
That's awesome. Now, like as far as like what you do now, do you do, are you in kind of acquisitions or are you in asset management? What are you, what are you working on as far as like your properties and, and moving forward? So in, in real estate, the, I, I bucket in for multifamily in three cat areas. There's acquisitions, which is the guy that goes out and finds it. There's asset management. And to me, that's the hardest one. And that's the guy who makes sure you perform your business plan and you pull off what you say you are. And then there's the capital raisers. And those are the people that have relationships to make sure your investors are happy and help you get the capital for the deal. My main goal all along has always been to acquisitions and do asset management and to go with great partners that come in and help bring in the capital raise and back up what I can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's worked out really well for me. So I focus on acquisitions and asset management. I partner with people where my weaknesses are. And it's it's been very beneficial. It's been a great learning curve <laughs> through evictions and PM turnovers and, and all kinds of other stuff. But honestly, like, I enjoy that part. I enjoy the part of taking chaos and making it something nice. That's what I did in fire service, so that's what I enjoy with this. I enjoy the thrill, the hunt with the acquisitions. And, and so that's where my focus is. That's where my value add is. Mm -hmm. Now, like going through that, I'm sure you had uh, different things that you had to face, different things you had to kind of overcome. Were, any, were there any common like fears that you really had to just like push through? You know, I don't know. Sometimes you get something under contract, and you're like, "What am I doing? I, I don't know what I'm doing. Should I back out of this thing?" How'd you feel going through it? Oh no, it's it's, it's like that every day. <laughs> <laughs> Still like that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you're always going to have those things when you do anything new and uncomfortable, right? Like any business you're in, anything when you do something new and uncomfortable, you're gonna have this little gut feeling that's holding you back. It's holding you back because it wants you to be safe. And in the end, we've created this survival mechanism internally for ourselves to make sure we're safe. And when we're not safe, we wanna make sure our body and our mind wants to make sure we're safe. So you, sometimes you just have to be uncomfortable. And honestly, that's where the growth is. I tell my daughter when she doesn't want to do something, I was like, you got to at least try it because in discomfort is where we grow. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely something that um, it's, it's, it's a muscle. You have to practice it. And, and it's yeah. like one of those things that I'll try and I'll be like, yeah, I can't do this. Just forget it. You know, then I'll go back down. It's like, no, that wasn't a, that wasn't a final, you know, verdict on the situation. Let's try it again. And, and it is true. There's a big element of, you just don't like what you're not good at. So if you're able to practice and push through that uncomfortable phase of kind of getting the hang of it, then all of a sudden you'll like it. I mean, my kids do that with roller skating, roller blading, ice skating, bike riding. You know, it's not fun at first and you got to kind of make them, not just get out there and try again. But then before they know it, they love it and, and you can't, can't get them off the bike, you know? Yeah, because now it's easy. I mean, the, the crazy thing to me was I'm very, like, I need to know everything, right? And I went to my first ever event. I signed up with the Jake and Gina community for mentorship. Went to my first event in San Diego, like, two weeks later. I'm sitting at this table with these two guys, really good. Uh, Jeff Warner and Jeff Gebhardt, I don't know if you know them. Mm -hmm. Great guys. I mean, they're just great people. And they own tons of stuff. Like, they own single family here. This, they're all over the place. There's no clear plan. And they're talking about exit plans. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. You gotta have an exit plan. When you buy it, you gotta have an exit plan. And Jeff circles it and slides it over to his partner, Jeff, which is his brother-in-law. And he goes, this is what we've been doing wrong the whole time. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? He's like, we just buy stuff. He's like, if it works, you know, we just buy it. We don't have a plan. He, I was like, my heart like just stopped for a second because I couldn't fathom that lifestyle. But I'm not at their level because I don't take the action just to do stuff. Because right. I need to know everything. <laughs> well, okay, so has that, we were talking a little bit about this too before the call. How has that held you back and what are you doing now? I think you might have touched uh, a little bit on getting those tasks out as soon as possible, getting somebody to do them. And I think it was Brandon Turner that was always saying that, you know, uh, something about being a quitter. You know, the faster you can quit your jobs and get somebody else to do them, the faster you'll be able to grow. Yeah, I mean, I think if you really want to accelerate your growth, you have to add value to a lot of people. And you can't do that yourself. You either do it through VAs, you do it through systems, you do it through automations, or you do it through people that you employ. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you just can't do it all. You're, you're capped at a certain income and a certain rate. So by going out and doing the uncomfortable stuff and pulling more people in to help you, you almost feel like, oh, I'm giving up this, or I'm giving up this. But what I'm doing in my business when I pull other people in is I'm teaching them a skill. I've learned a skill, that's why, I mean, as much as it stinks, like you feel greedy, right? Because we talked about that complex. 
I bring value because of my knowledge and my experience and stuff now, mm -hmm. because I've, I've been through stuff. And that's why I get paid when I get paid. Mm -hmm. And that's how a doctor gets paid what he gets paid. That's how the electrician that charges you for a five minute job that knows how to fix it gets paid what he gets paid because he brings knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. And by you doing your knowledge and experience and helping other people out of you learn and experience, they can just grow too. Mm -hmm. And then there is an element that I've struggled with of, of shame of not being the one who's physically doing it. You know, you grow up in a, you know, a hardworking family and, 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 you know, for me, grew up doing construction with my dad, loved it. But there's definitely something that was a block in my mind feeling like if I'm not physically working, it's either not as valuable or, you know, I, it's not fair to them that they're doing the work and I'm just organizing. But in all reality, there is a ton of value in that bringing together because a lot of people can do the elementary skill, but not a lot of people can bring it together and organize it in a way that everyone is making money now and you're growing as a company. And so I had to really get past that and be like, no, there's a lot of value in what I'm doing and bringing, you know, virtual assistants to investors or other people and, and with the real estate gathering you know different properties reorganizing them so that you know we have medical students using our our properties and so yes you're hiring out underneath of you but there's a lot of value in the ability to to organize it and bring it together and grow as a business yeah i mean the, so my job as a lieutenant right i'm the guy that sits on the right hand side of the fire truck and if you know anything about the fire service, there's an engineer or a driver, right? He gets all the cool stuff. He gets to drive and all that. I did that job for a little bit. There's the firefighters in the back, and I tell everyone all every day long, those are the guys that do all the work. I'm just the guy that makes sure they have everything they need. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because now that I've advanced as a leader and grown and matured as a leader, like I've, I, my guys are really good. They do their, I mean, my guys and girls, they do a really good job. And if I get involved and I do stuff at their level, like the firefighter level or the engineer level, they tell me that's not my job. <laughs> and it, it shows because when I get out of my place as a leader and I go and do their job, no one's doing my job. No one's making sure their back is covered. No one's making sure they have what they need. No one's looking at the bigger picture because they're on their task. Mm -hmm. And that's when stuff can go wrong. And it's, it's helped me in business now because I look at it as like, okay, I have a PM. And someone's like, well, they're not doing this, so I just, I just market it myself. No, no, no. We're paying for a service. We get a service. Let's fix the problem. Move on. Because if I'm fixing every single one of your problems and doing it, like, mm -hmm. you're never going to do it. And now I'm getting more work. And I can't do what I need to do, which is go buy more stuff to give you more properties to manage so you can grow your business as well as me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of just staying in your lane and, and being able to grow as a leader and as an individual. Now, are there any books that you have read that you're like, we're just either that or audio books that you've listened to that you just feel like are worth their weight in gold? I mean, I think any education you put back into yourself is worth its weight in gold at this point right like now. So for me, I, I started probably two years ago. Whenever I go on a podcast or I hear something on a podcast or I, I read a, something and they talk about a book, I have an Amazon list. And I just buy like six, seven at a time. And sometimes I read them, sometimes they sit in, but I have a huge bookcase and I've read 99% of them. Mm -hmm. And it's because at some point that hits me for a reason. One of the first books that really hit me was The Slight Edge. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a really good book, but basically it was when I was, I was up for a promotion at work. I would have been almost an administrative pool and it just wasn't feeling right. Like something just felt wrong to me and that's when all of this shift in my, my whole life happened into real estate. And I ended up turning down that job, but part of it was because I read that book. And one of the things he has you do in the exercise is he wants you to write a eulogy to, your, to everyone for your deathbed. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, this is this. Uh, uh, I sat down and read it, and I was like, well, I'm never going to get there. Like, I can, be, I can wait my 20 years, 25 years as a firefighter, retire, build another business, do this, but I, I, I may not ever get there unless I start working on it now and changing my path. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me go, okay, well, I need to shift some stuff. Yeah, that really goes back to what Stephen Covey talks about, beginning with the end in mind. Looking at that picture, what do you want people to say at your funeral? What do you, what do you, what do you want to accomplish and people to remember about you? That's really big. That's awesome. I, I have not read The Slight Edge. I'll have to check that one out for sure. Now, let's talk about your W-2. How, how in the world do you manage a full-time W-2 and you're full-time in real estate? What's that look like and what are your plans with that? I'm like everyone else. You just juggle until you can't anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, 
So I, I'm, I'm lucky compared to a lot of people, right? Like my job is a 24 hour shift. I work one full day on and I have two days off. I've worked really hard and I'm an officer of the station, so I kind of control the day. Like as long as there's not an emergency call that comes in or something that we're scheduled to do, mm -hmm. we have flex time in there. So I still have to train my guys, we still have to eat. They like to work out. Sometimes they get me into working out with them and I hate it, but I love it because they're great. And <laughs> we, we do stuff, but then I have downtime in between. So. I try and take advantage of that. The other thing too is, like me and you were talking earlier, is my kids are in school. So like right now, I'm doing this because I want to be a more present dad. I want to be home. I want to be a father that's here. So if I'm working at seven, eight o'clock at night, like it makes no sense. Like I'm, I'm giving up that time to build something. So I, I try and block my time very well. So I got off this morning at 7.30, I was home by eight. I did some office stuff. Me and you were talking now at like 10 o'clock. 11 to like 2 30 or so i'll be working on a bunch of other things i need to work on and following up and then 2 30 i drive and i go pick up my kids from school mm -hmm. and then from 3 to like probably 8 o'clock tonight like it's it's 100 percent my kids and my wife dinner whatever chaos mode if i have to i attend to it but i i don't like i i've had people call me at times and i'm like hey i'm I'm occupied at this time or they want to schedule something at five o'clock. I'm sorry. I've got other commitments. Mm -hmm. It's just my nice way of saying like, this is my time for my family. Yeah. And it's worked out really well because I, I need to guard it. I'm the type that I'll, I'll get buried in my work. I'll just go a hundred percent. So yeah. it's my, it's my check on myself to, to go. Nope. That time's for them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody said one time something that really shifted my, my mindset on time, you know, because I, I t tend to be the same way. I just take on too much. I hate to say no. And I load myself up on top of that. And so I don't remember if I read it somewhere or somebody told me, but basically you don't manage your time. You manage the tasks that are in the time. And it seems like such a slight shift. It doesn't even seem like what's the difference, but there's a big difference. I started to really look at, okay, I mean, I have the same amount of time. And if I'm actually focusing on it and I'm being very deliberate what I'm placing in each time block or, or, or day, I get a lot more of what needs to be done, you know. And then the second thing is separating the urgent from the important, you know. Everything has to get done, but what's the <laughs> most important? What's going to move me towards those goals? So those two things really change the way that I look at my days. Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned from uh, one of the gentlemen I hired to mentor me, he goes, does it serve you, right? So like do me doing certain tasks, does it serve me? Does it get me where I want? Is it what it's best interest of me to get to where I want to get? And, and I think that comes back to knowing your overall goal and vision, right? Like right now, my goal and vision is to get more financial freedom and time freedom with my family. Mm -hmm. But long term, my goal is a lot bigger than that. Like I want to be able to help a lot of people that are in my position now or lower that think that this is the best I'll ever get. I should be grateful for it. That want more, but kind of stuck. Get to that next level. And I can't do that if I don't push myself, but at the same time, like, it's nice to have that vision because what I do is, if I look at doing something, one of the first things that I have to ask myself is, is this going to help me get to that long-term vision? Is it going to help me get to that more time with my family? Is it, and does it fit my mission in life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Are there anything specific that, is there anything specific that you feel like really stops people from becoming successful? Ourselves. I mean, <laughs> I would love, I, I, we all have excuses, right? Like, I can't do it because I was born here. I can't do this because of this. My mom was disabled. We grew up, like, if the car had AC that week, it was a good thing. You know what I mean? Like, we were living paycheck to paycheck. My dad worked two to three jobs. I saw him on our visitation days and his weekends. But he was usually working because he, he worked, that was his way of providing and being a dad, was working. Uh, by all means, like, we were okay. But, like, we didn't live a high life. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'm way better, I think it's almost like a survivor's guilt right now wanting more, because like right now I'm way better than I ever thought I would be. Sure. Because of where I came from. Mm -hmm. And it, nothing wrong with where I come from, but like, man, you get around some of these people and you see how easy it is and you're like, the only reason I'm not there is because I'm letting myself stop. I'm stopping myself. My, my mindset, my, my head, my, whatever reason you want to give yourself is what's stopping you. Yeah. And, and it's just the choices you make in life. And if you don't like the choices you're making, then the cool thing is you can choose different choices. Yeah, for sure. You just have to want to. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it is. It's it's those stories you tell yourself and, and 
you know, it, it really does boil down to yourself and your mindset. So very, very true. Well, do you have any other tips or anything you want to share? If somebody's just starting out, kind of like what we've talked about, I mean, there's a journey. You're at the beginning and, and then there's like the infinity line. There, there's no place that you actually get there. And that's something I've really seen more and more. But is there anything that you would say to somebody who's starting out and they, they, they know that they want more, but they're not quite sure what to do or how to go about it? What would you tell them? I think the first thing is, is getting clear on your goals and your mission. Like, what do you want? And it's okay. Like, you don't have to have the full answer. You just have to have something that gets you going in a direction. Mm -hmm. You can't drive to California and think you're going to get to New York, right? So just keep that in mind. By having your goal or what you want to accomplish and make sure it meets what you want, it allows you to start going in a direction. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is like, you don't have the metaphor of eating an elephant, right? Like, to me, I get overwhelmed and I look at like, okay, I want to buy multifamily. Okay, well, I need lenders, I need this, I need this, I need partners, I need this, I need property management. And it's so crazy, but here's the deal. If you do 1% a day, right, just one task a day, mm -hmm. it compounds exponentially. And that gets you to this point of like, it's easy, right? Like, mm -hmm. I know who to call, I've done this work, I've done this, I got this. So just start with one task. And then when you got something you have to do, like that property you get under contract or the property you're looking at or whatever, what's the next step, right? Like you don't need to know what title company am I gonna use if you're looking at a property, right? Like it doesn't, that, you can figure that out. You got time. The next step you should ask yourself is, do I like this property? Does it meet my criteria? Mm -hmm. Does the numbers work? Like, you know, start with the small questions, like, and give yourself the small victories. I think that's one of the hardest things that I have too, is like, I'm already looking at the next level and, I'm, and we were talking, I was around a bunch of guys that they do very well off for themselves. And I, I was asked to come speak and it was great, but I'm sitting here saying, I only have 40 units right now to my name with four or $5 million valuation. Why do you guys have me in this room? And the gentleman that asked me to come in the room owns a property management company, he's a friend of mine, he goes, Chad, he goes, there's people that would kill for one unit. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought back to myself, like, I remember that. Like, I remember a year ago, like, I was like, if I could just get one room and prove to myself, I'll be great. And now I'm like 40 units going, okay, what's the next one? What do I have to do next? Mm -hmm. And so celebrate and look back and see how far you've come to during that journey. Like, I look back and I'm more proud of taking ownership for my life and changing my mindset and, and putting that into my children and my wife and the other people around me. And, and being more calm now because like one of my guys he's young at the firehouse and he's got all these excuses for stuff and he's like oh I was like look at the end of the day if you want to do it you're going to do it you just have to choose to he's like it's not that easy I was like it is <laughs> like, it's that step it's that first step just like you said I think I have wrote in one of my books I can move a mountain as long as it's one shovel at a time and I'm the same like if I if I knew what I had to do to get where I am I probably wouldn't have even tried <laughs> if I just knew if I just know a few steps ahead I'm like oh I can do that let's I gotta learn this I gotta learn that I gotta learn this and then as I take those couple steps I'm like oh wow the rest kind of lights up in front of me and I'm like okay I got to do these and, and I'll just keep going and, and I plot on and then when I turn around I'm like wow we really come a long ways you know multifamily business you know you might think you know seven figures is a lot well to a seven figure person eight figures is a lot to eight figure you know there's always someone above always someone behind and it's just taking that one step taking that one step at a time yeah and just pushing yourself I mean I think I think when you're not pushing yourself and trying something different you can live a normal life like you can be fine a buddy of mine he's like my kid doesn't want to go to college blah blah and then we were talking, he's like, when I go to my vacation house, because he does, he's got a sales business, he's like, there's this guy with this shithole next to me on the lake that sits on his front porch and drinks Natty Light all day, and he just looks so happy. And I was like, that's because his life goal was that. Like, and that's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That is what he wanted for his life. You just want a different life. You can't be mad. I said, but you can't be mad at your son either for wanting a different life too. Right. So if your son, just help him find what he wants to do. And then... Try and make sure it's right decisions, like not doing drugs or like getting in prison or something. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, Chad, I really appreciate you getting on today. You've added a lot of value. I appreciate your story and the struggles that you've been through and the stuff that you've learned along the way. Is there a specific way that listeners could get a hold of you if they wanted to get to know you more or reach out and, and contact you? Yeah, they can. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn at Chad Tucker. Uh, they can also reach out to me at chad.tucker at Acorn Capital Solutions, which is our company. 
And, and by company, it sounds really official, but it's just me and my family, so it's amazing. And then you can call me, anyone can call me if you want. Just reach out, text me, whatever. 850-206-4603. If I don't answer right away, I'll get back to you because there were people that answered my phone call to help me get to the next level that if I can help someone get to the next level, you're helping me more than I'm helping you because I, I'm, I owe it to the people that did it for me. I love that. Thanks, Chad. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you have a fantastic week. All right, thanks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so grateful that you took the time to invest in yourself and to learn with me today. If you're interested in joining a group of like-minded people, I want to personally invite you to our free networking group where you can make connections and build relationships with people who are working together to generate wealth. Just click the link that is included in the show notes, and I hope to see you there.